So hello everyone. My name is Thomas Sandell and I'm a gastroenterologist and hepatologist working at the University Hospital in Aarhus, Denmark. So it's a small country of six million people. Um, we're located on top of Germany and and we take care in our hospital, which you can see here on the right, we take care of all with disease patients in Denmark. Um, but it's only 6 million inhabitants, so we have a population of about 50, 50 wolf disease patients. So I'm very happy to be here today to talk about the use of copper pet in wolf disease. I'll walk you through that in the next uh, 15 minutes or more or less. So these are my disclosures. So what is PET or positron emission tomography? Well, in this technique or technology, we really use the radioactive or use different radioactive materials to to trace what happens to different elements. And, and, and any radioactive material that will emit a positron, we can trace that. And um, it's used for multiple different things in medicine today, the most frequent one being uh, actually a sugar pet or a glucose pet, which is used to detect different types of infections or cancer, cancers. But what we use, of course, is copper pet. We'll return to that. What happens is you inject or ingest a radioactive material. Um, this material must be a positron emitter, being positron emission tomography. What happens to the positron? It meets its counterpart, the electron, and these are each other's antiparticles. And when they meet, if you think back on your high school physics, these two uh, elementary particles will actually annihilate and send out uh, a photon signal. And that photon signal we can detect and we can actually very precisely localize. Um, and that's the technology we really harness here. So, so any radioactive signal that can produce a positron can be used in a PET machine. And so again, cover 64 is the cover of the trace that we use here in Wilson disease. And that's of course, because it's, it's just copper, but it's a radioactive version and it emits a positron. Mm -hmm. It has a half-life of about 12.7 hours, making it very ideal for medium to uh, long-term studies on, uh, on Wilson disease copper metabolism. We can go to about 65 hours with this. So this is not a months and year study. It's a, it's a, it's a medium time frame, uh, copper investigation, but it's, it's ideal for, for these, um, for investigating these types of things that I will come back to a bit later. The machine looks something like this. And for any of you who've been into a CT or MRI, this is uh, very, very familiar. And what we get out of it is, first of all, the PET signal, which is the uh, the actual detection of where the copper is. And here you can see a lot of copper going to the liver and also the intestine. And then we typically fuse it with an anatomical image that could be um, that could be either a CT or an MRI. And when you fuse those two images, you get something very beautiful like this. And you can see, oh, this is where the copper is going. And one thing is you can see where it is. You can actually also quantify how much is where. You can furthermore follow it over time. So you can see, well, now it's in the liver, now it's in the bile, now it's in the kidneys or wherever it goes. So this gives you both the, the quantification and the resolution time-wise to see what's happening, making it very ideal for copper. Uh, metabolism investigations. So today I'm going to talk about three possible diagnostic or three possible projects we use. And one is to diagnose Wilson disease using a PET. The second is the evaluation of different treatments by PET. And finally, the testing of new drugs. I will not mention in interest of time the use of PET in uh, animals, but we do investigate both uh, rats and rodents and also larger animals like pigs. And that has, of course, its, its advantages, but that's uh, for another day. So first of all, diagnosing Wilson disease using a pet. So this is 
This is a pure pet signal of a healthy uh, volunteer. You can see two hours after an IV injection of copper, most of the copper has gone to the liver. We can see also a very nice little black spot here indicating exactly where the gallbladder is. And that, of course, is a proof of biliary excretion. And further, if you look at 18 hours after injection, you can see not only copper in the liver, but you can also see uh, and the colon being quite visible here, indicating again uh, hepatobiliary excretion <clears throat> into the small intestine. So that's exactly what Wilson patients can't do. And and in line with this, after two hours, you see a lot of copper in the liver in a Wilson patient, nothing in a, in a gallbladder. And looking at 18 hours again, just more copper in the liver. You can see a, a small shadow here in the small intestine, but this is actually just copper brought directly by blood to the bile, uh, sorry, to the, the small intestine and not uh, uh, not an, an indication of excretion. So if you measure this, almost all the copper goes directly to the liver. So by, by this, we can actually diagnose Wilson disease. And of course, this will not be something you use for your everyday clinics. You will still rely on the current methodologies, including, including uh, investigation of your genes. But for very specific, specific cases, for instance, we have now a young girl flying over to us from London. And she has two pathogenic mutations, but other than that, no indication of Wilson disease at all. And she has been on therapy since she was three. So should she continue or not on this therapy? And that's, I think, if we can prove she has copper excretion by this method, she can, we can take her off treatment. And that will really be a way forward for her. So, so it's in these kinds of rare cases that this is really an interesting tool. So moving on to the uh, second type of project I would like to talk to you about namely the investigation of existing treatments by PET-CT. And we have here SYNC as, a, as our investigation. So the research question we asked, and this was actually done by my PhD student, Emily, is think therapy, 150 milligrams times one daily, as efficient as the standard of care, and that is 50 milligrams three times daily. And this is, of course, in the interest of the patient. Could you just collect all the, all the pills in the morning and that would be just as efficient. So that was the first research question. And the second was, is zinc gluconate as effective as, effective as zinc acetate? And so these questions we put into one study and we tried to answer them by PET CT. And the way we designed it was that we gave the patients an orange juice containing uh, copper 64. So this was a very expensive orange juice. And then we, after 13 hours, measured how much had been absorbed from the small intestine into the, and had gone to the liver. So this was done baseline. And then after four weeks of oral uh, sink treatment, we did it all again. So orange juice, and then measured how much copper had gone to the liver. And the idea, of course, being that the way sink works is it blocks copper absorption. So we should see less copper in the liver after four weeks of zinc treatment. And for this study, we used healthy subjects because in Wilson disease, the copper absorption is not impaired. It's the excretion by ATP7B that's impaired. So we could either use Wilson or healthy subjects for the study. It really doesn't matter. So much easier for us to use healthy subjects. So we divided the study into these four groups, zinc acetate 50 milligrams three times daily, zinc acetate 150 milligrams one time daily, zinc gluconate 50 milligrams three times daily, or zinc gluconate 150 milligrams one times daily. And then we did a scan before and after four weeks of treatment. And let me guide you to guide your attention to this image on the right. This is a before and after PET image of the liver. And you can see a lot less copper here by, you see that by the different colors, a lot less copper going to the liver after uh, treatment. And we saw a 
median reduction of about 50% in the first three groups. The only one that really stood out as not as efficient was singlucinate one times daily. But the other three um, groups had a, a very comparable and uh, very comparable efficiency uh, in reducing uh, hepatic uh, copper uptake. So on its own, this indicates that zinc acetate three times daily is just as efficient as zinc acetate one times daily or as zinc gluconate three times daily. And this is, of course, very interesting, but has to be viewed in context of the other available zinc literature out there, and there's quite a lot. So please talk to your doctor before you switch your therapy. What was also interesting for us was the quite variable effect we saw in the patients, some having very, very, very uh, profound effect of zinc therapy and some not. And some of this is due to variability within the study and others is probably also due to a different um, effic efficacy of zinc for that specific patient. And this has actually also been published in previous studies. So, so food for thought here, but talk to your doctor before you do anything. And the third a possible project I will talk to you about was the testing of new drugs, and I will use the tetrotiamolipidate, also known as Lexion 1840, to some of you. And I'm sure some of you have been on this drug. And my PhD student, Frederick, did the work here. So at the time, we started conducting these studies in, in collaboration with Lexion Therapeutics. It was a promising experimental copper chelator for use in Wolfram disease treatment. It appeared to have a different mode of action to dpnl triantine, but the, the precise action of TTM was unknown at this time and still is to some extent. So what was uh, available in the literature at the time from in vitro studies and also from animal studies was that we knew that copper would find TTM, that would again find albumin, and together these three comp compounds would find would form the so-called tripartite complex with TCM, copper, and albumin. And there was a study from Japan in rats showing that then this tripartite complex would actually be excreted into bile. And so this was kind of ideal for us to see if we can show biliary excretion in humans. And so we gave uh, was a disease patient um, IV copper before and after TGM treatment. What we first saw was actually looking at blood, a retention of copper in the bloodstream. You can see here, you can see the vessels in the arms. You can see the heart uh, after treatment. And this is not visible before treatment. And this is the graph of what it looks like. So this is this fits completely with the idea of the tripartite complex. It's, it's absorbed differently than copper alone. So, so just an indication that something has gone on very efficiently with the copper at this time. And then we really wanted to look at hepatobiliary excretion. And so what we saw here was a lot of copper in the liver, some in the kidneys. But to our surprise, we couldn't see anything in the gallbladder. And this was also the case for the small intestine and the colon. We could not see any uh, sign of copper excretion by uh, TTM in Wilson disease patients. And so this was a surprise to us. And what we then looked at was what about copper absorption? Could TTM has, had, have an effect uh, comparable to that of zinc, where it would bind copper in the small intestine? So we gave healthy volunteers uh, TTM treatment and then gave them uh, oral copper before and after just uh, like the design you saw before with the sink patient or sink study. And as you can see here, this was a very, very powerful copper signal before treatment. And the liver is then after TGM completely void of copper. And looking at it more quantitatively here, we can then confirm that TGM has a very, very powerful uh, impact on hepatic copper uh, absorption. And then secondarily, this is probably due to an impaired the intestinal copper absorption. So we believe that this is one of the ways that TTM actually works. Um, and that was to us, of course, very interesting. 
So let me summarize for TTM. TTM did not increase hepatobiliary copper excretion as measured by C copper 64 activity in the gallbladder. Copper was retained in the bloodstream after TTM treatment, and this was, this was in line with, with our theories about the tripartite complex formation. It is unclear if and how the TTM copper complex leaves the body. But we can say that TGM strongly and significantly reduces hepatic copper 64 activity, indicating a very effective inhibition of copper uptake from the intestine. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have shown you that copper 64 pit is a very versatile tool in the investigation of Wilson disease. It sets new standards for drug investigation and it can help aid in diagnosis and in drug development in Wilson disease. So thank you so much, and I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Oh, hi, everyone. This is live. Um, so there's a few questions here that I'd like to answer. Um, so one of them is, is this head similar to radioactive copper that was used for Wilson diagnosis back in the 60s? So, so the radioactive copper in the 60s was uh, typically the same uh, as what we use now. They, they also used copper, uh, six, uh, radio copper 67. Um, we use 64. Uh, depend, they're a bit different, but the principle is completely the same. And what, what's new here is the um, much more in-depth spatial and anatomical information you can get. Back in the in the 60s, you could only get a blood sample, for instance, and measure the radioactivity in that, or in a very a broad area across the body, you could measure radioactivity in that area. With this PEC technology, as, the, as I've shown you in the pictures, you can very specifically and clearly see where the copper is at a certain time point, and you can follow it where it goes afterwards. So so in principle, it's the same as it, it's an, it's an add-on to the technique that was developed in the 60s, but now with a much more, it's like playing on a very new stereo compared to what you did for many years ago. So that was the first question. Um, the second one here is, would the PET scan show copper in different areas if the Wilson disease patient had more neurological symptoms and no liver symptoms? So bear in mind that this technique only has a half-life of, or the copper only has a half-life of 65 hours, so, or, sorry, 12.7 hours, and that means we can detect it for about 65 hours. So we only have this really short time span to look at. And for neurology, we don't, we don't see a difference uh, um, at this, within this short time frame. So no, this will be the same for both neurological patients and for liver patients. Um, so moving on to the next question, is there any difference when, with using zinc sulfate rather than gluconate or acetate? Well, um, in theory, they are comparable. Only one have been, at least in Europe, um, uh, uh, approved by the EMA, but we still use some of the other compounds in the clinic. There is a difference in, in side effect profile for sure, um, but in theory, it should be equally efficient. But there's a lot of uh, uh, other stuff going on here. So you should definitely talk to your doctor before you change therapy. So uh, as a zinc user, we're attempting to want to take zinc acetate 150 milligrams once daily based on your study in healthy volunteers. What kind of study would be needed to confirm uh, an easier dose regimen, trying to caution against people making changes based on a small study with healthy volunteers. I completely agree. And that's also what I said in, in the presentation. So this is a study that adds on to the existing knowledge we have, and you should always carefully talk to your doctor about your options. So, but I think this is, uh, this is something you could take into consideration uh, when talking to your physicist. So for compliance and sync regimens, do you recommend once daily versus twice daily? So a bit on the same line here. Um, I will not, in, in this talk, recommend anything specific. I would recommend you talk to your physician about it. But this is, again, knowledge add, that adds on to what we have in the first place. On to the next question. Will this technique be available in the clinics in the US? So that's a good question. I don't know. There's, in practice, uh, nothing that will hinder the the use we haven't patented or anything like that. We we cannot. 
So it's free for any hospital to take up this technique and use it. And as a matter of fact, we've encouraged it, of course, because we want to spread this technique. But there's a lot of hindrance in terms of um, bureaucratic paperwork and so on that needs to be done for each site before they can use a new radioactive compound. So that's at least what's what scares some um, clinics away from from using this uh, this method. Are there any hospitals in the US using PET scans for the diagnosis and guiding treatment? Um, that's another question. So to my knowledge, there's not. I know that's, that some radioactive studies have been done. Um, uh, I think it's in Michigan, but I'm not sure if they use the PET there, um, or you have to ask them directly. So to my knowledge, there's no one who does it in the States at this time. What, what is the half-life of cover 64? So that's 12.7 hours. So both biologically and physically could decay prevent detection of elimination. So yes, that's, 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 a, that's a good question. Of course, since we only work within this time frame, you have typically about five half-lives and that means 12 hours times five where you can detect the radioactive copper and anything that happens with the cover afterwards, we can't detect it. So. So, so if elimination of some compound or drug or whatever we're testing, if that happens afterwards, then we cannot test it using this this technique. So, so you have to be aware of the limitations of PET when you use it. So that was a good question. So, moving on to the next one, have you used PET to distinguish between symptomatic and unsymptomatic carriers? Um, no. So we've used it for for special cases of di of diagnosis of of patients um, to distinguish whether they were carriers or not because as you uh, know then the then genetics of with the genetics of Wilson disease is not easy so you, we have a lot of um, variants that are of unknown significance and in that light sometimes we can as physicians be in doubt whether or not this patient is actually a true carrier or a true patient or what happens. So in, I think for those very special cases, PET might be interesting, but uh, normally we could rely on the, so to speak, normal diagnostic uh, uh, workup we have, and that is uh, typically more than enough. So this is really for the special cases. Um, so what did you learn about mode of action of metanobactin with cover 64? Um, so so metanobactin is a is a compound under um, under investigation at this time point. We we have uh, along with other uh, groups published uh, papers where, where we looked at rats where we gave them metanobactin and looking with PET we could see that there was actually a clear um, excretion via bile to the gut using metanobactin. So that was that was really something we learned from the from the PET studies or actually that we confirmed because they had had some uh, studies in the rats already that indicated this was the case and we could really nicely show it with the PET studies that this was indeed the case uh, at least in a rat model of Wilson disease. So this has not been done in, in humans I must stress at this at this time point. So what is the half-life of zinc gluconate? I can't remember at this point, so sorry about that. So I think that was the, the final question um, here. So unless anything else is coming up, I'd like to say thank you for your attention.